Thank you, oh. 
we're in chapter 7 this morning. And so we come to the section where there's clearly a, set, a change in, not necessarily in subject, because obviously this is what Paul wants to write to the church of Corinth. But the first six chapters are Paul's rebuke of them because they are what? Babies. They're, they're acting immature, they're worldly, and they're not resolving problems the way that they had been taught you know, by Paul himself. And he addresses all of that here at the beginning. So when we look at chapter 7, and I do make a little bit of a, a, a joke how when we come to chapter 7, Paul begins by answering their questions and come out from the chapter, it seems like we have more questions from the question than it seems Paul gets answers. And I think some of that is because two things. One is, we only have the part of the question that Paul gives, that he quotes from them. And then the second is that we don't know what it's like and where they are. Let me, you, and this is not an exact parallel, but it is a similar parallel. How many of you know what it's like to live in India? Not at all. But when you walk down the streets of India, um, cow dung is what's used in the fields to light their fires. Now, what do you think that creates as an aroma in culture? Yeah, okay. And then they use that to cook their food. Okay? That's just one example. That's also true in Africa. So when we start talking about, well, we understand what it's like to live there, guess what? I'm not sure we do. I'm not saying that that in, in, indicates that there is no morality that needs to be demanded of people. That's not what I'm saying. Is that, but it's, it's a vast difference to understand principles of life and what it's like when those principles hit people's lives and how it works. I think that's the case in 1 Corinthians 7. Uh, case in point would be, notice Paul says, look in verse uh, 32. He says, I want you to be free from what? Anxiety. Anxieties, the English standard says. I want you to be free from uh, worry about how all this is going to work out. Notice he says in verse 26, I think because of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. So there are, there are things going on that Paul is privy to that he suggests in the response, but I'm not sure that we know everything about it. We have to take what is revealed and make application for certain. But we need to be careful that we don't act like we know more than we do. That's all I'm saying. So in chapter one, or chapter seven, verse one, he says, "Now concerning about the things which you wrote." About. Remember, we had talked about that there is a Corinthian correspondence that First and Second Corinthians are part of, but not total. That Paul wrote to them to which he makes reference in chapter 5, verse 9. They wrote to him, to which he makes reference in chapter 7, verse 1. He writes to them, 1 Corinthians. Then in 2 Corinthians, he makes reference to about which he wrote, something that's very hard to locate in 1 Corinthians. So the presumption is he wrote a very hard letter to them about the problems that still were unresolved, and then he wrote 2 Corinthians. So that whole story, we're going to develop that even more when we get to 2 Corinthians. But that is part of what's going on with this correspondence. Now, let's read through verse 24 and hope that we can all of 
Now, in response to the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to use a woman for sex. Now, that's my translation. Uh, what does your translation say? It is good for a man not to touch a woman. The English Standard says, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. So notice the implications like the Christian Standard when it says that, not to use a woman. Um, that's a translation that has some interpretation in it. I think the English Standard's translation is more accurate because the word touch is a euphemism. <laughs> it, he's not talking about don't let a man touch a woman. Don't touch a woman who's not, you know, that's not what he's saying. He's saying he's talking, he's using a euphemism like we might use a euphemism. Um, uh, they spent the night together. Okay? Is it possible for a man and a woman to spend the night together and not have sexual relations? Sure. But if I announced it on the pulpit and I said, me and, I, we're going to call her Ginger Joe. Ginger Joe spent the night together. What would be your inference? You know what your inference would be. Okay? Because we use that euphemism to be another way to express having sexual relations. Paul is using the, the euphemism that they use. I'm not sure he's talking about abusiveness that is implied by the way the Christian standard translates it. I think he's talking about relation. So let's look at verse 1 again. Now in response to the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to use a woman for sex. But because sexual immorality is so common, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife, and each woman should have sexual relations with her own husband. A husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise a wife to her husband. A wife does not have the right over her own body, but her husband does. And in the same way, a husband does not have the right over his own body, but his wife does. Do not deprive one another, except when you agree for a time to devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again. Otherwise, Satan may tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all people were as I am, but each has his own gift from God. One person has this gift, another has that. I say to the unmarried and to widows, it is good for them if they remain as I am, but if they do not have self-control, they should marry, since it is better to marry than to burn with desire. To the married I give this command, not I but the Lord, a wife is not to leave her husband. But if she does leave, she must remain unmarried, or be reconciled to her husband, and a husband is not to divorce his wife. But I, not the Lord, say to the rest, if any brother has an unbelieving wife, and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. Also, if any woman has an unbelieving husband, and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce her husband. For the unbelieving husband is made holy by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbeliever leaves, let him leave. A brother or a sister is not bound in such cases. God has called you to live in peace. Wife, for all you know, you might save your husband. Husband, for all you know, you might save your let each one live his life in the situation the Lord assigned when God called him. And this is what I command in all the churches. Was anyone already circumcised when he was called? He should not undo his circumcision. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? He should not get circumcised. Circumcision does not matter, and uncircumcision does not matter. Keeping God's commands is what matters. Let each of you remain in the situation in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Don't let it concern you. But if you can become free, by all means take the opportunity. For he who is called by the Lord as a slave is the Lord's freed man. Likewise, he who is called as a free man 
is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of people. Brothers and sisters, each person is to remain with God in the situation in which he was called. Now, this whole section creates all sorts of questions. And as we began making the point that Paul's very clear that his concern in answering this question is to verse 22, uh, verse 32. I don't want you to be full of anxiety. And he talks about in verse 26 of the present distress. And so the answers to these questions, we have to make sure we don't drag the meaning of these words into our modern society. Because in the ancient world, how could a man divorce his wife? Anybody know? Walk out of the house, go to the gate. I hate this woman. I'm leaving her. That's all he had to do. And from in, in the gate, what could he call her? Anything he wanted. Okay? And, and Paul is writing to a Greek culture, to Corinth, not people who've grown up as Jews. So we can't borrow from the Old Testament and say, this is what the Corinthians knew, because how did the Corinthians grow up? Had they grown up as Jews or pagans? As pagans. So the commonality that we can connect to is, in our own culture, how easy is it for you to get a divorce? Pretty easy. Okay? I know it costs money, and that keeps people from getting divorces or other things like that. And, and people may live apart from each other and be separated really all their lives and never get a divorce. Or some, you know, it's just, there are all sorts of different situations that happen in the way our modern culture lives that doesn't please God. Paul is not addressing everything that happens in our culture. He's addressing what it was that they addressed to him in the question. So the first point is, you've told me it's not good for a man to have a relation with that there must have been some among the church who were saying that if we're to be holy people, then what should we abstain from? Sex. Sex. That there were some who thought that the lust of the flesh that occurs in sexual relation was somehow inconsistent with being a believer and being a Christian. And Paul's point is, you got it all wrong. That why should a man have a wife? He tells us in verse 2. Because of sexual immorality. Why do you tell your children to not sleep with everyone that they are, they're around? Why do you tell them that? Now, if you're a Christian, you're going to tell them because that's what God wants, right? But people down the street who aren't even Christians, and, I, and I'm not trying to be crass here, anybody, and anyone online, <laughs> I'm not trying to be crass, but people who are not believers, why do they encourage their children not to sleep around? STDs. And then what do they do to keep them protected from STDs? Do you know what they pass out to them? Okay. Yeah. And to the girls, to keep them from having pregnancies, pills. And then even parents taking their children for abortion. That's the culture we live in. Paul says to the culture that they lived in where they did not have any of those things, even though they had things to help prevent Pregnancies. They didn't have anything to control STDs, whatever they ha would have had in the culture. Because they had them, just different kinds. He says, because of sexual immorality, you need to realize each man should have his wife for sexual fulfillment, sexual relations. That implicitly tells you what did God make our bodies to enjoy? Sexual relations. It is not a perverse thing. It is a natural thing for the human body to experience. But where does Paul say it's to be experienced? In marriage. 
Okay? Notice also he says, and it's almost like Paul anticipates the sexual revolution of America. Okay? Uh, he says in verse 2, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife, and each woman should have sexual relations with her own husband. Notice the sentence structure is exactly the same. But we grew up, we grew up in a culture that who is typically the instigator of those relationships? The man. And if we have any inkling that the woman instigates it, what kind of woman is she? Don't tell me. <laughs> but God doesn't look at it that way. That in a marriage, it's equal playing field. In fact, notice this next verse. A husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise a wife to her <coughs> husband. So what is he saying? I'm responsible to take care of my wife's needs, and my wife is responsible to take care of my needs. Okay? Verse 4. A wife does not have a right over her own body, but her husband does. And we always stop in that sentence right there. Because what are we trying trying to emphasize? Ladies, you can't say no. That's what that that's how we take that verse. What's the rest of the verse say? And likewise, the husband also does not have authority over his body, but his wife. So who's in charge of my body? My wife. Okay. Paul never unequally places the relationship that's intimate in a marriage. As if the husband is in charge of that and the wife has nothing to say. Or vice versa, that it's equal. Because from God's perspective, the two shall become one. In that image, if they are one, then what are they? Equal. He doesn't say the wife becomes a half and the man becomes one and a half. The two shall become one. That figure intends to picture the conception of unity. And so Paul's answer to their question is that you need to realize that this union that you're telling a couple they're not supposed to have to be holy is the opposite of what should be. Then he goes on to say, verse 5, stop depriving one another. Okay, Which is suggests to me that something was said in the communication from which he quotes that people were saying, well, I've given, up, I've given up my wife for Lent, or I've given up my wife for, you know, my commitment to Jesus Christ. And what did Paul say? Stop it. Do not deprive one another. But he does live, leave this uh, clause Except when you agree and devote yourselves to prayer, then come together again. This is not talking about living apart. It's not what this is talking about. What's it talking about? <laughs> Intimacy. When a husband and a wife, and, and typically, and I'm talking, I'm trying to be very practical here. When does a husband and wife typically have difficulty with That's when it often happens. And so he says, quit depriving each other, but when, it, when you do, what should you devote yourself to? To prayer. Because the thing that's keeping you apart, prayer is going to bring you back together. Then come together again. Otherwise, Satan will tempt you when you don't have self control so notice he says in verse 6, I say this as a concession, not as a command. That he's suggesting that I'm giving the concession that, that if you're having difficulties being intimate together, that then be separate. But plan to come back together, but pray while you're doing it. That's the concession that he's making. He's not commanding them. Well, Paul told me, honey, because you and I are fighting right now, then I need to go sleep in another room. Paul's not saying, I'm not commanding that. But I'm making a concession that this is what's going to solve your problem. 
And then he says, because I want you to see in verse 7, what's he saying? I wish you were all like me. Well, what does he mean by that? Single. Uh, single, unmarried. Okay. Now, there's only three men in this room and a whole lot more ladies, so we're not going to make any kind of jokes about marriage, right? But, but Paul being single, Paul being single, why does he want them to be like him? Because singleness and, and uh, not being married is superior? No, because he doesn't have to fight this battle. Okay. Uh, has your marriage ever been a battle? Nobody's going to answer. Okay. Okay. But Paul never had to deal with that. And he doesn't act like he knows it all, but he says, I just wish you were like me. But each person has his gift. And I think Paul's point is, is what was Paul's gift from God? That he could be a married. That I'm not sure that God gave him some enormous amount of self-control, but whatever it was in Paul's life that gave him a moment or gave him the ability to just be single. Because I know people, um, I, know, I know one person who's never been married, and I don't know how they could be single. I don't know how. Okay? Um, but... That's their gift. They have the ability to do that. And Paul says that that's what it is for me, but not everyone has this gift. Each person has their own gift. And another has that. Does that all make sense? That's the premise upon which all of the other comments are going to flow. All right. So verse 8. I say to the unmarried and to widows. Well, what do the unmarried and widows both have in They don't have a man. They are unmarried. They don't have, they're not married. So what does Paul say? Yeah, it's good for them to stay that way. Remain as I am, but if they don't have self-control, get married. Notice he does not say if they do not have uh, control to be more holy than everybody else. He if they don't have self-control, they should marry because it's better to marry than to, your translation will say burn, the Christian standard adds with desire because that's the significance of burning. Burning with a desire where you can't, and in fact, I was just studying with someone today about how Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus. He went to the Sanhedrin and said, I'll betray him. And when he returns, he is in the upper room with Jesus, partaking the communion, or the institution of the communion. And Jesus leans over to him and says, remember, what you do, do quickly. What did Judas know in that moment? He's on to me. Right? And where does, what does Judas do? He goes. <laughs> And he brings the Sanhedrin to the Garden of Gethsemane along with the soldiers. And then he walks up to Jesus and he kisses him. But y'all forget that that's not the most important thing. When he walks up to Jesus, he says, Rabbi. The word of respect that all disciples give to their teacher who called him before he kissed him. What was it in Judas that was making him do that? We'll say sin, that's fine. But it was a passion that was uncontrollable in those moments because he was more interested in money than in oil. And so to the same point Jesus, that happened in Jesus' life, Paul is applying to those who are unmarried, that if you know you're going to burn with a desire, better to marry than to do what? Any questions over verse 8? Because that's, do we really have any trouble with that? He's going to return to widows at the end of the chapter. But now he's addressing the married now. Verse 10. To the married I give this command, not I, but the Lord. So 
This is a command. He's already said in verse 6 that I'm explaining something as a concession about one specific aspect. That is, if y'all are having problems, <coughs> deprive each other with prayer, but come back together. That's a concession that he's made. A, a helpful advice to solve that problem. But he says, when you are married, what did the Lord say? A wife is not to leave her husband. But if she does leave, she must remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. So here is the Lord's instruction. We're, and we see that the Lord had said that. You remember in Matthew 19 that when the Pharisees came to Jesus to tempt him and said, Moses said this. Uh, about uh, a husband leaving his wife or divorcing his wife and Jesus' answer is it's because of your hardness of heart that Moses even gave you that instruction and I say unto you that if a man divorces his wife and marries another he commits adultery. Jesus says it pretty bluntly and pretty plainly right there. And so Paul is reiterating exactly what Jesus taught. Not I, but the Lord. Then he comes to verse 12, and it's through verse 16 that we have all the fun. But I, not the Lord, say to the rest. Well, who is the rest? The married couple who's facing this description of abandonment and divorce. Verse 12. If any brother as an unbelieving wife, and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. Now, the way I understand what Paul is describing is in the first century, who was being converted? It's really not a trick question. Trick, trick question. Unbelievers. But in practical reality, did everyone's marriage if the man became a Christian, did that automatically mean his wife would become a Christian? No, and vice versa. So Paul is describing to the Corinthians a process that was happening in the lives when people were being converted, and I'm going to start following Jesus, and I'm going to go on the first day of the week to worship God, and the spouse says, oh, no, you're not. You're my wife. You're going to take care of the house. Oh, no, you're not. You're the husband. You have to go out to the field on today. And what did the husband and the wife in those situations have to do? Decide if they were going to follow Jesus. And so it created difficulty in their marriage. And if you have an unbelieving wife and you're going to be committed to the Lord, what might your wife decide? Well, I'm not going to put up with your Christian weirdness and I'm going to go find me another husband. Okay? So he's describing that scenario. He says, if a brother has an unbelieving wife and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. That must mean, everybody, it is not sinful to be married to an unbeliever. Okay? I'm not saying it's wise to be married to an unbeliever. But if it was sinful, what should Paul have told this believer? Kick the unbeliever out and you start over. That's not what he says. Because what did Jesus say about marriage? Stay married. So if I become a believer and I have an unbelieving uh, wife, I am not to divorce her. Verse 13. And if any woman has an unbelieving husband and he is willing to live with her, what? She must not divorce her husband. It's the same equity that he applies in the previous paragraph, the first paragraph. And it's an equity that in the first century, which would have been unthought of. Because in the ancient world, who usually walked to the gate to, to bring the divorce? The man. Okay? And I'm not saying that women weren't ever treated properly or rightly, but it was a man's world. Where women did not have any voice, let alone in government, they rarely had voice even in their, their communities. Uh, in Greek 
And so when we come to this next text in verse 14, the word holy used in the Christian standard to describe this relationship, he's explaining his point. That is explaining that the reason that I as a believer stay married to my unbelieving wife is because I manifest holiness in our union. For the unbelieving husband is made holy by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy by the husband. Not that I make my wife a Christian. And I don't really think Paul is saying, if you stay with her, she's going to become a Christian, even though he's going to make that point in verse 9, 15, and 16. His point is, is that you're doing the holy thing by staying married. And that's the point, is that if marriage is where sexual union is to be, there's nothing unholy about sexual union. Then notice he says, verse, the next part, otherwise your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. That doesn't mean that if I stay married to my unbelieving wife, that suddenly my children are Christians, are holy. That's not what he's saying. What am I making my children? I'm giving them an environment of holiness commitment, a demonstration of what God wants. And that's what holiness is. In fact, what is holiness? What's another word that we often connect in English with the word holy? Sanctified. Okay, so in the Bible, when the word sanctified is used, it means set apart for a For a special, and usually the word holy is usually often used in the definition. So sanctified is setting something apart for a holy purpose. Okay? Not a common purpose, but a unique purpose. And so that's what he's saying, is that you sanctify your relationship when you stay together by your wife being given this special place where you as a Christian, and what's going to happen is that an unbeliever is not going to usually be sympathetic to a believer's choices. But then he says in verse 15, but if the unbeliever leaves, whether it's a man or a woman, what did Paul say to the married believer? Let him leave. Okay? And that sounds crazy to us, but what does Paul say? Envision that if, if, I'm, if I'm a Christian and my, my spouse will not stay because I'm a believer, I can't make them stay because what will it be forever? A difficult relationship. It won't be holy. It won't be righteous because they'll be fighting if I'm going to just let them leave. And here comes the part that we Discuss. A brother or sister is not bound in such cases. God has called you to live in peace. Well, the question is, what is that brother bound to? Well, I think it's answered in the first part of the sentence. He is not bound to keep the unbeliever locked and throttled in the marriage. I don't think he has anything to say about remarriage. He's only talking about how when my unbelieving wife leaves, I can't make myself their slave to them. A brother or sister is not bound in such cases. God has called you to live how? In peace. Now, when we come to this verse, we struggle because uh, it's sometimes called in religious writings the Pauline privilege. Where in this passage, Paul is granting the believer, when the unbeliever departs, to be free to remarry. Do y'all see the word remarry anywhere in this verse? I don't see it in there. And ironically, 99% of the time, when the Pauline privilege is called into use, the person calling it into use is a believer, and the person who's leaving them 
mean, I've had conversations with people. They'll say, well, what about Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 7? My wife, who's a Christian, doesn't want to stay married to me anymore because she doesn't like the way I talk to her. And if Paul let the believer, let the unbeliever leave if they marry, then I can. Well, number one, who are the people that he's describing in the first place? A believer and an unbeliever. He's not talking about two believers. And he's not talking about two unbelievers. He's talking about a believer who's married to an unbeliever and all of the crises that that creates. And he says to the believer, if your wife, if your unbelieving spouse chooses to leave, just let them leave. Because Paul believes already that in verse 6 and 7, I wish all people were like me. He tells the unmarried and the widows, what should they do? Stay unmarried. Why would he now tell the believer when the unbeliever leaves, okay, now you can divorce and remarry. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, God has called you to live in peace. Quit trying to make them stay. And so he says in verse 16, don't you know you might save your husband? Don't you know you might save your wife? That's why he wants them to stay married to the unbeliever. Any questions on that? All right. Y'all don't have any questions on that? Anyone online want to shoot me a text and say I disagree with you? Okay. Uh, it is a passage of great difficulty. I'm not trying to say that that's the only way to read it, but that is how it reads to me. Um, I don't believe Paul is teaching what's commonly called the Pauline Epistles. In fact, I think the NIV, when it translates this, it says, you're no longer under servitude. When it translates the word bondage, you're no longer under servitude. That's the sense of the word. It's, it's not you're no longer under a marriage, but you're no longer a slave to that spouse who won't stay. Just let them go. And the point that Paul is trying to tell the believer is you have not failed God when the unbeliever leaves. Because if the unbeliever won't stay with you, you can't make them. Any questions? I'm not understanding what you're saying. Well, I mean, if you're if you're in a marriage, you're responsible for the spouse, for the spouse, and for for you know making providing shelter, you know, sure, providing sure. all that stuff. Like that. I mean, it's it's covering that part of it too, not just the fact that you're letting them go. I mean, you you you're not you don't have to go get them an apartment. Okay. So I'm trying to money and I understand what you're saying. I mean, it's talking about that as well. Yeah. I think that might be implicit, but I do think in specifics he has in mind the... I think he's, a, he's described, if I was the believer and my unbelieving wife left me, then knowing what Paul has just said about my responsibility to my wife and my wife leaves me, what's she going to do? He presumes that my wife is going to be sexually active. That's what he's presuming. Because if I'm married and I've had a sexual intimacy with my unbelieving wife, and then my unbelieving wife, what's she going to search for? The warmth and compassion of a sexual relationship with another man. Okay? And so what am I going to feel as a believing husband? What have I led my wife to do? Commit adultery. And what does Paul tell me? You are not bound to that. You're not enslaved to that. I'm not suggesting that Paul would not agree with what you said. That Paul wouldn't say that you're no longer bound to that wife. Um, but I think that he has more in mind that specific application because this whole chapter.
So then he says in verse 17, so let each one live his life in the situation the Lord assigned and developed for him. I became a Christian. I have an unbelieving mind. I have to keep that course. And Paul says, this is what I command in all the churches. So he says in verse 18, and they're all um, rhetorical questions. If you're already circumcised when you're called to become a Christian, you don't have to undo it. <laughs> and, and vice versa. Well, I mean, you can't, but I'm kidding. But he's just being rhetorical, okay? And if you're uncircumcised, he says, well, don't get circumcised. That doesn't matter. He's already said that in other passages. Keeping God's commands is what matters. And what God commands is for you as a Christian to do this. And then he adds in verse 20, let each of you remain in which he was called. Now, what Paul would Paul would say, well, Don, if you're an adulterer, you just you became a Christian, now you need to stay an adulterer. That makes no sense either. Don, you were a murderer before you became a Christian. So, Don, you were a thief. You were a mastermind of the criminal uh, network. <laughs> He's not saying that. He's simply saying that whatever you were called to God to be, then, then be that. Were you called while a slave? Don't let it concern you. But if you can become free, he doesn't say, Bear the burden of being a slave so you can announce to everyone I've chosen to be a slave because I'm a Christian. That's not what he's saying. What did he say? Freedom comes to you. Be free. Be free. 